Welcome, this is Otamin reporting live for Premier Magazine from the Edinburgh Parallel Computing Centre. And we're here with the three people from the Next Generation I.O. project. Uh, Tiago Quintino, uh, Michelle Weiland and uh, Adrian Jackson. And uh, the project has just finished, so we will uh, discuss a little bit about the, uh, the results and where it will lead to. So, uh, Michelle, to start with, can you tell a little bit about the project's achievements? Yeah, so the project has just finished, as you said, at the end of September after four, four long years of, uh, of collaboration with many partners. Um, Tiago here is, is from ECWF. Um, other partners are Fujitsu, Intel, uh, TU Dresden, Barcelona Supercomputer Center, and so on. And um, we've all worked together to deliver a prototype with Intel CCPMM memory. Um, that includes both the hardware solution, the prototype we host here in Edinburgh, and a full software stack delivered by some of the partners, including us here in Edinburgh. Okay, and the, what were the project goals? What, what, what were you aiming the, at? The project goals were to move, remove the I.O. bottleneck as much as possible from HPC simulations, and not mm -hmm. just traditional HPC simulations, also the more upcoming um, data-intensive, data analytics-type applications. So try and use this new memory technology to get rid of this, this gap, this performance gap that you have between DRAM and the parallel file system and try and put this layer in between on node to try and get, get rid of this bottleneck. Okay, so it's, it's, it's faster than solid state disks or? It is much faster. It's, a, it's about, if you look at it from the other end, it's about 10 times, slightly less than 10 times slower than DRAM, but it's much faster. It's, I think it's about 100x faster than a solid state disk. Okay, and what are the typical uh, uh, things for which you could uh, use that. I mean, it's always nice to have something which is fast, etc. But what, what, what can you use it for? You, you can use it for, um, so this memory can be used in two ways. You can either use it as very fast storage or as slightly slower but very large memory. So it depends what your use case is. If you have a problem that doesn't fit into traditional DRAM the way you have it on your system, this is a good way of, of you know, being able to run on a smaller node count but with very large memory. Or you have uh, cases such as the open form application that writes lots and lots and lots of files which will kill the performance of a parallel file system so you can use this memory as an intermediary step right onto this memory and then later on copy your data off and the performance improvement is, is much much greater because you're not limiting your performance by the slowness of the parallel file system. Okay, that, that sounds all very computational. So, but um, if you use it in real applications, so perhaps you can tell us a little bit about that. So, in, in our case, we took our um, the part of our workflow, the one that, that suffers more today from from I/O performance issues, and we ported it to the system. We also changed the application, the I/O stack below, to take advantage of the NVRAM uh, uh, the devices. And what we have been able to demonstrate is that the the, the current bottlenecks we see in our systems today are, are gone, are not there anymore. And, 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 and I.O., at least in this system, with the configuration that we tested, is not a bottleneck. Okay, and your, your, your systems are, your applications is from the... Uh, weather forecasting. Yeah, so weather we, forecasting, we, we, yeah. we have run uh, some weather forecasting simulations, running the, the data, but at the same time we have the, the consumers of that data, which uh, read the data as the model is, 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 is writing. So usually this is, introduces a lot of contention on the I.O. system. These this devices, this, these memory store, uh, devices do not feel that contention. Mm -hmm. And the, uh, the users that you have that are the, the, the users from the uh, European Centre for Medium Range Weather Forecast, mm -hmm. so that are people that are doing the forecasts or doing the applications for the, yes. for the forecasting. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, the, this, yeah. is, this is in it, the, the usual uh, Workflow is to prepare forecasts to send to all, all our member states or all our countries, so yeah. across across Europe. Yeah. And and of course it's it's about getting data fast in and out of uh, of the uh, of, of the computer in, uh, out of the memory. But what amount what size of data are we talking? So about? today, if we would have to to u use this system, we would put about twenty terabytes of data within a, a slot of one hour. In and immediately out, mm -hmm. and it's this is this is a so, so kind of like a rolling uh, access of data throughout the the whole uh, forecast, which is a, a ten day forecast. Yeah, and um, with a with a new system, but I, I I assume that you only did do testing. It's not 
operational, I guess. Yes, yeah. this is only a, a demo, a, dem a demonstration. Yeah, and what, what do you expect out of it? Um, well, I think we, with this system shows that if we if you project this performance to what will be at the exascale, uh, uh, an exascale forecasting system, mm -hmm. this system will be able to cope with what an exascale forecasting system will throw at it from the point of view of data, right? So, so that means that for exascale, we are ready concerning I/O. We only need to build the processor. This we need. Well, we need. We need to build the systems, but yeah, this yeah, yeah. certainly can be uh, a component, important component for an important component on that system. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Can you tell a little bit about the technology behind it, uh, perhaps? Well, so the hardware is is, is this Intel solid state memory, yeah. non volatile memory. Uh, but of course, that comes out of Intel, and that's something they've been developing for a while. And that's also in their Optane hard disk drives as well. So, this the the difference here is this is this memory inside the memory channel, sitting as DIMMs in the nodes, uh, and that means you can access it from your program as if it was main memory, as if it was RAM. So you can access it. But individual bytes or cache lines uh, and get the data that way compared to what you would do normally with a disk drive where you go have to access on blocks on, on large blocks 1k blocks 4k blocks maybe bigger than that so as well as the raw performance it gives you as Michelle has already said you know it's not very, that much slower than main memory so on our, on our prototype system in a single node we can get about I don't know about 180 gigabytes a second of data transfer into memory if we, if we run a benchmark mm -hmm. On this, in this uh, Optane memory, it can do about 30, 35 gigabytes a second. So it's considerable for a single node, but it also lets you access that memory in access patterns, which are good for your application, but would have been bad for performance in terms of the actual uh, systems we've had in the past. But of course, that also comes with challenges, because now we're putting them, the storage inside the compute nodes. At the moment, we have our storage outside the compute nodes in a parallel file system. So a lot of the work that we've done in the project uh, ourselves and other partners, including Barcelona, uh, has been to set up a soft software infrastructure to support that. So how do you let users access their data? How do you port applications to use this without having to go through all the work that ECMW have done? Because they can afford to do it for their big application. But for, you know... The lots of applications we run on our big systems, some people won't have the time at the moment or the skills to port it, so can we still use this hardware? Maybe not quite get as good performance as Tiago, but still get something out of it. And so we've done quite a lot of work on file systems and data schedulers and, and integration into the whole system to, to try and support that. Yeah, the, um, yeah, we should come back to that uh, in, in a moment. Uh, f first, the, uh, this type of uh, memory, um, if you turn off the system, will, it's, will the data stay on? So absolutely, that's the, that's the whole point behind it, it's persistent. So yeah. you have to be slightly careful when you're using it because you have to write the data to it and then make sure the data has already got to the memory before you turn off the system. So, so you have to sort of flush it out or, or persist it. So that's a slight change when you're programming it, but apart from that, absolutely, it'll stay there. Yeah, so, so in that sense, it's more like a file system? So it's like more a like a disk drive. Disk drive, drive, media, yeah, disk drive. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yes. Yeah, yeah. So, can you tell a little bit about the, uh, the, the, um, the, the software extensions that you did, or the software? You yeah, so one of, the, one of the key things we worked on is an extension to Slurm. So we use Slurm as the uh, resource manager on the system. Yeah. And so we've extended that to be aware of this new type of memory. So because you can use the memory in two different modes, you can use it as, as either slow memory or as fast storage. Um, and you do that via rebooting the node. We have made the... Um, we have made Slurm aware of this, and you can, when you submit your job, you can say, I want my job to run in memory mode, and I want my node to have at least, say, one terabyte of memory free. You submit your job, and Slurm will either reboot the node if not nothing like that is available, or it will schedule a node in the correct place. So that's one, one extension. Another thing we've done is because the memory is persistent, you can envisage a scenario where you have a sort of producer-consumer workflow. So you have an application that produces data, and you have a consumer that wants to read that data. Now what you do at the moment is you write this to a parallel file system, and then the next application will come and read this from a parallel file system. But what we're trying to do is get Slurm, because Slurm is aware of the non-volatile memory, you can say, well, I'm producing my data on this node, I want the next job to be on that node, and you just leave the data on node. So you, you don't have this penalty of writing to a parallel file system and reading it back. 
And so those sort of, sort of extensions we've done with, with Slurm, which I think are um, the most significant ones, mm -hmm. really on existing software. Okay. And um, if you would expand the, uh, the system, you, you would expand it, would that be easy? Is it just like... In terms of the number of nodes, adding the number of nodes, yeah. um, I don't think it would be hard. I think it would be uh, it's just um, you know, a matter of adding more, more racks. We're currently um, just under two racks, not entirely full, so just add more of them. It's designed to be entirely scalable, up to as large as you can afford. Yeah, and is it the idea that uh, that that later on uh, one of the companies will will take that over and make that a product or? Uh, so it's already a product. Uh, for okay. have um, released it as uh, a product in their in their uh, Primergy and Prime Quest uh, series. So there was a press release about that in July or August this year. Uh, you can read up which which exact server models uh, will include this and support this uh, technology. Mm -hmm. If you go back to the uh, to the uh, to the applications to the weather forecasting, yeah. I mean, it, it's um, of course it's it's nice that that you can speed up the uh, obviously it's very very nice that you can speed up the weather forecast. But other things that you can do now with this new technology that that, that yeah. So you think about? I, one of the things I, I think is particularly interesting in this technology is not only what it can do to improve what we do today, but it's the the horizon that is going to open. I think and the new things we will be able to do. So what it allows, for example, with, because of its density, the fact that you can put, you have byte addressability to a huge data pool on the order of multiple terabytes. Um, we can, for example, envision now keeping multiple weather forecasts in memory and allow our um, uh, users to access it at, through cutting through the data um, this is an hypercube of six dimensions, mm -hmm. so in time, in space, etc. And they can cut it and access the data in, in ways that previously would have been completely uh, um, non-optimal. And, and therefore, the, 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 the scientists, they, they don't think like that. They, 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 it's like a constraint that to the current workflows that they do, that they analyze the data in a certain sequence, because that's what disks today provide you as the best access pattern. But this system is, 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 is nearly flat with respect to, to the access across all the, 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 the data sets. So you will be able to access forward and backward in time in vertical directions, things that this will open up to, to high performance data analytics that we have not thought about. Okay, sounds great. The, um, if we talk about the, the technology future, I mean, this is just one project, of course. So, what are the the next steps that you in, in technology are taking, or, or think you will take? Well, so <clears throat> the hardware is obviously Intel and uh, and yeah. Micron's uh, memory, and that will progress. As in fact, there's a second generation coming out, I think, at some point next year. The processes that support that are going forwards. Um, we we will see this start to come into production systems. So, some of the big U.S. systems that are installed 2021, 22, 23, have said they will have this memory. Maybe not in every compute node, maybe in little islands in the compute yeah. nodes, but it's going to be there. There are lots of people working on file systems for single nodes, so uh, non-volatile memory optimised file systems. Intel have their object store, DAOS, which is where they're pushing forward as well as a similar kind of system, the ECMWF, but for people who can't develop their own, so that, that will be out there. And then we here are very keen on, on pushing forward with our software side of things, so the scheduler integration and tools to move data for users, tools to keep track of where the data is. Uh, the, the file system that, that our colleagues at Barcelona have developed, um, which will let you build a whole file system across these nodes, those are all going to be moving forward over the next few years. Uh, but actually, one of the really nice things is that the system's up and running. The project's just finished, but we now have a nice, stable usable system and we now have some you know, two or three years to make good use of this now so I think there's going to be a lot of work for taking applications, optimizing applications, seeing how users use this, interacting with industry, those kind of things. Okay so so you will keep it here uh, up and running and doing lots of testing and definitely. Okay. Yeah, yeah so uh, we're committed to running this for three years after the end of the project so okay. it's um, yeah I mean the, the project has finished but the, the system is brand new so it's going to be run for yeah three it would years. be a pity to just but sometimes in research that happens but not no, in this case not no in this not case. in this case it'll yeah. be around for three years and people will be um, you know free to apply for access 
and yeah. um, to play with it. And so they should just contact one of you and then... Yes, they can contact me. They contact you and then they, they will get... <laughs> and, uh, and if they ask nicely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. So, uh, thank you very much for this uh, interview. For Premier Magazine, this was Adam and Reporting. <laughs>